All right, we are live. This is very exciting, everybody. Um, this is the very first Spoilers Club. Uh, I am Mer Lafferty, and I just noticed I have not turned on a chroma key for my background, so you get to see my green screen. This is the very first Spoilers Club, and I made this overlay myself, so for some reason, even after podcasting since 04 and streaming for a year and a half, I still have a lot of uh, rough edges to, 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 to sand off or something, but anyway, I am delighted to be here with Lily Lanoff, who uh, has been so patient with me and uh, the author of One For All and willing to be the very, very first uh, person to bring all of her spoilers to the Spoilers Club. Welcome, Lily. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you. And you make it willing. You make it sound like it's a burden to be here. I'm so excited. Well, it's, it's you know, when you interview authors, the point of the interview is A, you know, help your audience, but B, help the author. You're a debut. It's We're still dealing with pandemic crap. We want to sell your book. And so if I have somebody on here and you know, we start out with, it's Verdon Jr., who's the killer. Very first spoiler. Um, it's like, why would people buy the book? And so I try to avoid spoilers when I interview people. And so that is why you're willing and wonderful to come here, because you're willing to come and tell us how you put all this together, because we're supposed to have fun here, but also this is for writers, and they want to know all the dirty secrets. So uh, just in case we have anybody, this is going to be putting out put out later for our uh, Patreon supporters as well. Uh, give us the rundown of One for All. It's not all for one. It is one for all. I've checked several times and only gotten it wrong on my other streams. So I'm going to get it right this time. Uh, just just like an overall summary? Sure. Just yeah. quick? Okay. So uh, One for All is a gender-bent reimagining of the Three Musketeers in which a girl with a chronic illness, and that chronic illness is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POTS for short. Her name is Tanya. She tr trains as a musketeer and uncovers secrets, sisterhood, and self-love. And there are lots of swords. And that's my alliteration. There are Pretty a soon. ton of swords. <laughs> um, well, let's let's go on let's start with the chronic illness thing um i you've mentioned on on twitter that uh that aspect of it made it hard for you to sell and yet it was a very important part to keep in the book right so tell me a little bit about that like did it yeah. push back and like say we want this but we want to change or did they just say outright reject or did your agent push back or what happened there right so um no, my agent has always been super supportive. Awesome. Uh, One for All was not the book that I signed with my agents for, actually. I uh, was signed for a different book that also had, um, was also had disability rep. It was an almost, it was a book of almost only disabled characters, actually. Um, and that did not sell on submission. Technically, it's still on submission. I would love for it to find a home one day. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, no, when we went out on submission with One for All, uh, we started getting responses that amounted to, and I think probably this this amounted to like 60 to 70% of the responses were, we love this book, we love the writing, we love Lily, we love what she stands for, but we don't know how to market this, or we don't know if there's readership. And I would keep on thinking to myself, well, women dueling in ball gowns with swords is inherently marketable. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's a lot of readership for that. Yeah. Um, and the first few times, you know, I just kind of chalked it up to that being the response that I was getting. But then you sort of start to realize what that's code for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that, you know, the readership question is, well, we, we don't know if there's enough readership of if people actually want to read a book about a chronically ill girl, which is ridiculous given the fact that... Um, in the U.S. alone, I mean, up to 25 to 30 percent of the population is disabled, and a lot of that includes chronically ill people. Yeah. Um, so uh, we got a lot of pushback like that. We got some pushback um, that uh, implied that the editor would have wanted it if the main character was from a different marginalized background and not not chronically ill, um, and w which is also really heartbreaking because I mean all marginalized authors like we we have so we're pushing against 
so many obstacles in the publishing industry. Mm-hmm. Like we don't need to be forced against each other. Like that's not helpful. No, we you're, not, need... you're not the right kind of marginalized that we're looking yeah. for. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so that was heartbreaking. Um, and one for all sold, I think just over a year after it went on submission. So it was a long time, but, uh, and a lot of ableism, <laughs> but, um, yeah. it ended up at the right house with the right editor. And I'm just, I'm, I'm really happy with how everything turned out eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from, um, our discord it's uh about the disability uh i wanted to ask about the main character's disability and the process it took to write a uh, disabled protagonist because you don't see that often mm-hmm. so right what was your process mm-hmm. so um i originally started writing one for all um back in the at the end of 2016 i think it would have been because it was when I was supposed to be working on my senior thesis. <laughs> um, so uh, I I only wrote a little bit of it before I graduated because I, tr- again, I tried to focus on my senior thesis. But um, when I started writing it, I tried to make Tanya very different from whom I was for who, because I felt like, I don't know, I think that because I had a book that didn't sell um, on submission before that had disabled characters. I thought that if I wanted to sell a book, I had to kind of erase disability and chronic illness, which is a whole nother, that I could talk for hours about that. Um, and Tanya was tall and blonde haired and blue eyed and not chronically ill and pretty much the exact opposite of who I am and who I was. Uh, and about a paragraph into writing, I realized that I couldn't authentically write this story specifically this gender bent reimagining of the three musketeers story because um as long as i've been fencing i've been fencing since i was nine ten years old um and i got pots i was diagnosed when i was 14 but but the symptoms started when i was around 12. so i've pretty pots and fencing have pretty much gone hand in hand for me for the majority of my life and i don't really know how to I don't know how to think about fencing or who I am as a fencer without the fact, without thinking about it through the lens of chronic illness, because I was only a fencer without a chronic illness for two years. Yeah. Um, And I've been fencing for a lot longer than that. So as soon as I figured out that Tanya was going to have a chronic illness, I wanted her to have POTS. I wanted her to have my condition because when I was a teenager, I didn't have any books about uh, girls like me. Yeah. Uh, and you start to think, well, is there a reason for that? It, is it because girls like me aren't capable of being main characters, aren't capable of you know saving the world and dueling in ball gowns and fighting dragons or riding dragons or befriending dragons or, <laughs> you know, you you start to internalize so much of that and so and that also, that internalized ableism and internalized shame is a huge part of Tanya's story. Um, And I knew that I wanted to provide the representation that I needed, but didn't get. And to be fair, I still need. Um, And once I decided that, writing about Tanya having POTS um, was, easy but also incredibly difficult in the sense that I knew exactly what I was writing about I knew exactly the same the symptoms I knew the feelings that she was feeling um but also I was opening up old wounds that hadn't really healed properly so it was emotionally difficult but the actual craft aspect the 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 act of writing about the illness was very easy well one thing that got me was um i'm like what is what does tanya have what does tanya have and i realized this is hundreds of years ago there's no there's not going to be a name for it she's not going to spell it out for me and so 
Um, I, I, watching you try to describe this illness only through symptoms and not through, well, it's a problem with the neurology or the brain or whatever, like we hear now, it, it was, I, I was just wondering if you ran up against any man, if I could just say it's, it's a spinal thing or a nerve thing or whatever, but I got to go around it and just say, she's sick. Was it, was that a oh. challenge or was... Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I, because POTS is, you know, it, it is a, a disorder of the autonomic nervous system, you know, it, not being able to reference blood pressure. Yeah. <laughs> or, and I, I can, I can kind of get around the heart rate issue because you can feel your heart rate saying, and that's something that, I mean, you read about in books and every people write about in every genre. That's why the pants worked. I yes. was gonna ask about why the pants worked. Yes. So the pants, okay. So the pants that Tani wears are my 17th century French fantastical version of compression pants, compression oh. socks. Okay. Which my chronically ill folks who are watching will know what I am talking about, especially if you have POTS or EDS or any other blood pressure related issue. Um, now, to be fair, uh, there wasn't actually fabric at the time in France mm -hmm. that they would have access to that mimicked compression of fabric, but uh, that's why it's uh, historical fantasy and that's not right. historical fiction. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I do want to get to some of the spoilers here. Um, you have done something that is... Uh, oh, wait, we got one from Daniel. Assuming I'm correct in assuming uh, Thale was meant to have ADHD. Also, she would not have been diagnosed back then. She just sees flighty, easily distracted, who hyper-focuses on her hobbies, like the compression pants. So are you yeah. de delving into neurodiversity there, too? Oh, yeah. I mean, to be fair, I, I, I have ADHD, and I'm, I'm a neurodiverse author. So, I mean, and I don't, like, regularly talk about that a lot because I've been talking about chronic illness and pots a lot because that is the focus of the yeah. book. But, no, I mean, if we want to talk about neurodiversity, I mean... Listen, Tanya has anxiety. Mm -hmm. I think that that's like that's. I mean, she has panic attacks in the novel. Yes. Um. Thea has some form of ADHD. Mm -hmm. Aria is neurodiverse. Yes. I don't know. Um. I I. I've had people read her as autistic. I've had people read her um. As um, just or as and like a number of other things um portia portia i don't know I, I think that it's hard because as a neurodiverse author my brain works a certain way and i think that some part of all my character probably all my characters are neurodiverse because my brain doesn't really know how to write non-neurotypical <laughs> doesn't really know how to write neurotypical character yeah yeah um i see that so, a lot in authors a lot of people at least in in our more vocal um discord talk about adhd i was diagnosed as an adult and i'm just seeing i see it everywhere and i'm like you're a creative person aren't you and it just really i i think that's one of our superpowers but it does you know comes with a lot of other crap but um yeah we a lot of as k kimmy says woo adhd club so yeah mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's your, your, your different characters are awesome. Um, did enjoy all of those. Now, I have to admit that I have not read The Three Musketeers. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious how much of personalities you brought over from that, or if they're just, if they're entirely new characters. See, that's, I, I, I love that you asked that question specifically, because I've had a lot of people who have brought up the fact that the plot feels very different um which is intentional because i i did move the time period it's not the same it's about around 30 years later um from the initial three musketeers and the reason why i wanted to do that in the first place was because i felt like if there wouldn't be new ground for me to tread in terms of the whodunit aspect mm. uh and also this like little two three-year period between la fronde the french civil war and versailles um, almost nobody writes about it because to be quite frank, Versailles is a lot more interesting and flashier and more fun. Mm -hmm. So I had, a, I had a lot of room to move around in this kind of little two year long span, three year long span. Um, as far as the characters are concerned, 
I really wanted them to feel like their own people. I didn't want them to feel like complete mirrors of the original characters. So what I did was um, I mapped their character traits um, in ways that were more abstract than concrete. So my the, the, the example that I, I usually refer to is Portia and Porthos. Um, in the original novel, The Three Musketeers, Porthos is described as larger than life. He drinks a lot. He eats a lot. He uh, sleeps with a lot of women. He, I mean, it's very lusty. Um, he's very hungry. And Portia is very hungry, but in an abstract sense. She's hungry for women's rights. She's hungry for what she wants. She knows exactly how she's going to get it. Um, and I think of her as a, you know, I think that Tanya even at one point describes her as ferociously hungry just for everything that she wants. Um, and I kind of took that, I, that was kind of the model that I was using. Um, because also, I mean, these are, you know, men in their 20, you mm -hmm. know, late teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and teenage girls. So I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to have them be exactly the same. Um, and then I, I, I did my best to, uh, have familiar character names, but that was really difficult because the original three musketeers character names, those aren't the actual three musketeers names. Those are their nicknames. So they're not French names. Mm -hmm. So I spent a week kind of crying over my computer, trying to find <laughs> potentially histo like historically non-anachronistic names, girls' names from the 17th century France that kind of sounded like Latinate names that were not from <laughs> this time period and not at, oh my gosh. So it was rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you, uh, you've got our, our classic sort of, it, 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 I guess it's sort of a love triangle, although it doesn't feel like it because the two men never interact, but, um, you do have the, the, the hotter of the men turns out to be the bad guy, but, uh, it takes a while for Tanya to accept this. Um, mm -hmm. how often did he... I think I missed whether he was actually there in the first scene at her house. Was he one of the guys there? No. No, okay. No, he was okay. not. So he sent somebody. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, did you find it, it, do you find it difficult to write the, the difficult, I, I, I've not written a love triangle before. So uh, what can you tell us about crafting that and keeping it, um, uh, what are my words? Uh, up in the air, and because you really did, you, you could tell she had feelings for Henri, but she was seriously falling for uh, Verdun. So, how do you, how do you craft that? Right. So, for Tanya, I thought about it l less of a lug, less of it like a love triangle because for Tanya, you can, I think the reader can tell that she has feelings for Henri, but I don't think that Tanya can tell. Tanya's just yeah. really not and i think that you know some people have described her as naive but i think that it's it's mostly because i mean she's a 16 year old girl who is chronically ill and has grown up in a town who has who have told her pretty much that because of that no boy is ever going to be interested in her yeah there's no love in her life that's what her mother says don't don't wait right. for love there won't be any right so she doesn't really know how to deal with a lot of the feelings going on inside of her i mean and you know it's hard enough you know as a teenage girl trying to navigate feelings right <laughs> and then you add in the fact that you're chronically ill and that complicates it even more and then you add in the fact that tanya's in 17th century france and that mm -hmm. adds on a whole new aspect to it so for tanya um, I really wanted her and Henri's relationship to be more about um, a friendship first and foremost mm -hmm. and in terms of like building trust. I mean, she's obviously attracted to him at, when she first sees him. But then again, um, she as she brings up, she's like afraid that she's cursed to blush, you know, whenever she, some like a boy her age talks to her because she just doesn't have the opportunity to mm -hmm. <laughs> 
actually talk to other boys in her town because there aren't any. Um, but um, I, I wanted it, I wanted their relationship to be incredibly slow, slow building, but I wanted to show a healthy aspect of how their relationship grew mm -hmm. um, versus her relationship with Etienne, with Verdon Jr. Um, and um, Verdon knew exactly, like he, I really wanted to use Verdun's character to interrogate um, the kind of character that YA readers are encouraged to, you know, uh, like in love triangles. Um, because I think that, and I and I have, you know, friends who are like, oh no, but I loved like Etienne, like the bad boy, he's so great. And I really wanted to kind of unpack that because at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the book, when Etienne says that he loves Tanya, he believes that he loves Tanya. That's not a lie. Yeah, like, he that. actually does. Yeah. But it's not... I don't think of it as love as an as an author because I, I, I don't think of love as something that is... Like, at least... I, I don't want to portray love as... Uh, as, as uh, um, I don't know. Healthy love as something that's destructive. Um. And it's not healthy, the way right. that he views love and the way that he thinks about love and talks about love and believes love, what love is. Um, and uh, for Tanya, her her falling for a ten was very quick. Um, and I think that you know there's this element of he is the first, the first uh, boy who has ever really validated her, who has ever told her that she's beautiful. Um, who has ever really shown interest in a concrete way because with Henri he's so bumbling and nervous and I think that Tanya doesn't see what's right in front of her a lot of the time because mm -hmm. he's not explicitly obvious for Tanya you have to be like I like you Tanya <laughs> and even then sometimes it just doesn't register because what's I need your to angle there <laughs> what yes. do you mean by like yeah, because to be fair, I mean, and this has to go comes back to um, her own experiences and also just being chronically ill. I mean, you know, whether it's, you know, Marguerite, her best friend from before ghosting her. Oh, yeah. You know, 17th century French fantasy <laughs> version. Um, you know, she's used to people. She's used to people leaving her. Mm -hmm. Or people deciding that she's not worthy. So to have somebody who is reaffirming that over and over again and having that kind of undercurrent of, well, actually, he's not behaving in a way that he should be. He keeps on apologizing for things and never actually changing his behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the one thing that I really wanted to hit home in that so when readers could go back, they could find the kind of the trail of breadcrumbs in terms of how he in in his deception um in how he would and in, in how he manipulated her and how he wasn't i mean obviously he wasn't honest but um <laughs> i um he the way that he acts you know he, he knew exactly what he was doing right um and then also the you know I also really wanted, because I wrote uh, One for All, started writing One for All right around the time of the Me Too movement started taking hold. Mm. Um, and I wanted to talk, because I don't think that it's possible to write a gender-bent reimagining of the Three Musketeers in which teenage girls are seducing men out of secrets without talking about consent. You can't write that novel without yeah. talking about consent. Uh, and um, all the girls talk about consent and have you know versions of consent arias is touch averse and that's made like you know clear early in the novel um Thea, um has her own um uh, backstory when it comes to her previous experience with um sexual harassment and sexual assault uh tanya has you know kisses at 10 and has this you know romantic what she believes is a romantic first kiss moment and then later 
when she talks about it with the other musketeers, with the other girls, and she starts thinking about the situation that she was in and the fact that she had no opportunity to say no and the fact that she was sick, but also that he knew that she was sick. He knew that she was she was feeling really unwell, but kissed her anyway mm -hmm. um, and didn't think to wait <laughs> yeah. until she wasn't dizzy, until she wasn't sick. Um, and so, you know... I wanted, but by the end of the novel, I wanted the love triangle I aspect to kind of break apart or kind of crumble apart in terms of, um, not that Tanya's feelings necessarily go away. Um, and I mean, if I ever get to write a One for All sequel, which I would love to do, I already have lots of plans. Oh, um, good, because that's been a question for several people. Um, oh. I... I I wanted, oh, someone in chat asked if that meant that Versailles was a open for a sequel. You're talking about the, the little scrap mm -hmm. of two years. You look very coy right now. <laughs> um, uh, what I will say is this. Uh, I would be lying if I didn't have a sequel title, a sequel synopsis, and sequel pages written. Uh, Excellent. However, uh, One for All was purchased as a standalone mm -hmm. and I don't get to decide whether or not I write a sequel. It's yeah, up to the publisher. We talk about that here a lot on I should be yeah. writing. <laughs> and it's, it's personally, I mean, I love my publisher. Mm -hmm. I do. I think I, I, I personally, I mean, I haven't talked about a lot about my feelings about it. I mean, I've talked, I've said how much I would love to write a sequel, but I think, I would be pretty heartbroken if I didn't get to write one because I want to show Tanya healthily exploring romantic connections. Mm -hmm. I want to show her having gone through this journey of overcoming internalized ableism. I want to show her at a point where she is actually learning to love herself and not really doubting herself as much. And I think that that's a really important message and story to share Very much. with readers. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, I have lots of I have lots of story plans um, that perhaps involve the the King of France and Thea and like lots of other little goodies. <laughs> but like, I I can't. I mean, That's you know, awesome. I I really hope that it happens. I really do. Um, yeah, that's so all I can say. My question is, um, as someone who's never been able to be an actress or pretend about hardly I, I just I wear my emotions on my sleeve a lot and the idea of you know seducing men and not like six like pulling it off the manipulation and not falling for them just felt I, I basically I felt like Tanya entirely like that I totally would have fallen for him too I mean mm -hmm. it's it's that is just how I thought and I thought okay my first question is didn't they have a way to deal with that? I mean, I, I, I could tell it's like, don't fall for your your target, but it, it, it felt like you're dealing with, with teenage girls and mm -hmm. in, in a world where they've been told forever that, you know, snagging a man is your only way to continue living. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it just, I, I felt like, I don't know, Tanya was thrown into the deep end, and I'm not putting this, like, bad storytelling on you, but I'm like, what was... And I can't remember her name. I didn't write that one down. Um, Madame de Trivi. Yes, Madame de what was she thinking? And now that we know there's, like, a romance building between uh, Tanya and Henri, we also know that Tanya has proven herself to the Musketeers. Mm -hmm. How is Henri going to act when she does her next job? Yeah. I suppose that's going to be in the plot. <laughs> oh, oh yes. Oh yes. That's okay. that's a huge yeah. Um that would be a huge uh part of the next book if it, the next book is Excellent. written. Um I think that no but you hit the nail on the head. It's that Madame de Trivi really does throw Tanya into the deep end. She does not take into account Tanya's very specific circumstances. Mm -hmm. I mean Portia's a lesbian. So she's not she's not falling for any of the yeah. male targets. Yeah. Um, Arya is demisexual and she's bi. So she also is not falling for any of the targets in her own like in her own ex 
experience of her demisexuality is not falling for any of the any, any of her targets just, just to make it clear demisexuality mm-hmm. is not discussed very much can you give us a quick um mm-hmm. uh 